we are all on a spiritual journey. From the beginning, God planted seeds of purpose in all of us. Each one of those seeds is infused with God-given potential, and it is God's will for us to grow and take next steps. The church is the hope of the world. It provides a fertile environment where people can plant the seeds of their time, talents, and treasures. Combined with the watering of God's word and the light of God's presence, the roots can be nourished and go deeper. And it is God's will for his church to grow. Our church is to be a place where people can know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Vertical Church is a place to grow. All right, everybody say that. Say it with me. Say a place to grow. I am so pumped. I don't know if you could tell. I don't know if you could tell. I'm so pumped about this series. I'm so pumped about this series. Tell somebody he's pumped. Tell him he's pumped. He's pumped. I'm pumped about this series. A place to grow. God has put in my heart a couple weeks, a couple, actually a couple months back, he put in my heart to just develop a series where I can just communicate the heart and the vision of why we do church here at Vertical Church, of how we do it and why we do it and why we do it the way we do it. Can I get an amen? So, so, so I'm really pumped and I'm really encouraged because I believe, I believe that it's so important for us to be on the same page. If we're on the same team, if we're in the same family, if we're part of the same organization and we're moving and running together, it's so important to be on the same team. And I, I'm so excited and you know, the funny thing is, you know, I've, I've kind of talked about and cast vision for, for, for a while over these last couple of years, but I know and I'm feeling, I've been praying that this is a moment where the Lord really just wanted to just kind of stamp it into a lot of our hearts. And, and if, you're, if you're maybe a guest or maybe you're visiting us with a friend or family member today, we understand that. I think that this, this uh, uh, message and God's word, because there's a lot of word today, is going to encourage you. Be encouraged. So if, if, if you're not part of this church family, you're, just, you're here visiting and, and somebody invited you, praise God, I'm thankful you're here, I'm happy you're here, and I think you're going to enjoy it. I think you're going to grow, I think you're going to learn something that's going to bless you today, right? And you can, maybe you could take it to your church, take it to your church family and be encouraged. Or if you don't have a church for home, consider this one, right? Those of you who are part of this church family and, and, and you've done our growth track and, you, and you've signed our membership covenant and, you, and you're a member of Vertical Church, I, I really want you to really take this and run with it. Those of you who've been coming for a while and maybe you attend, maybe you consider this your church, haven't officially maybe taken the step of becoming a member and going through the growth track and everything, I really want to encourage you to really consider if, if, if this is where God wants you to be. And if so, man, get involved. Take that next step. Amen? I'm so pumped. I'm so pumped. A place to grow. Vertical church is? All right, some of you got it. Vertical church is? A place to grow. And I want to start off with this first message uh, entitled God's vision. God's vision. Because the reality is, it's not, it's not my vision as a pastor. It's God's vision. And that's what we're doing as a church. I, I also believe that what we're talking today, a lot of it applies personally and individually as much as it does for church. But we're going to be talking in the context of, of our spiritual home, the church. Okay? And so I, I want to start off. It's important to get our minds right. It's important for us to agree about our mindset and be on the same page. Is it, doesn't it feel good when you're on the same page with your teammates? Doesn't it feel horrible when you're, you're on a team or in a group and people are kind of going their own ways? It doesn't work. Things don't work that way. So when we're on the same page, when we can come into agreement about how we feel and how we think about something, it can be very, very powerful. So I want you to open up your worship guide. There's a lot of notes, a lot of blanks to fill in today, and there's a lot of word. In fact, we couldn't put all the Bible verses like completely written in the guide because they wouldn't fit. We will have them up in the screens, and they're always in your Bible. So you can always open it up and find it there. Um, I want to get into the word, and I want to start off with what it says there, truths about growth. Can we start there? Is that okay if we start there? We're talking about growth. We're talking about a place to grow. Is there anybody here who says, I never want to grow. I, I think I've done all the growing that I want to do, right? I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually, right? <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, in, in, in life and maturity. Everybody, we all want to grow. We don't, nobody wants to be stuck. We all want to move forward. We all want to progress. Nobody says, I'm done. I don't, I don't need any more. I don't, I don't need to know anything else. Even in work, we consider these things. I want to grow. I want to progress. I want to move forward. And so that's why I want to talk about these truths about growth. Let's go to number one. If we want growth to happen, you and me have to believe together, number one, that it is God's will for my church to grow. It is God's will for my church to grow. By the way, side note, it's God's will that you grow too, individually, personally. We're talking about a place now. We're talking about an environment. It is God's will for, the, for his church, for my church to grow. Acts 
Acts chapter 16, verse 5, talking about the primitive church, the early church, it says, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and they grew daily in numbers. What are the two things that happened to the churches? They what? They were strengthened in faith and they did what? And they grew daily in numbers. So in the early church, there was some exponential growth happening. Now, I want to pause for a moment because there's a lot of people, and I I find myself in these conversations constantly, uh, there's a lot of people who don't believe this and like, well, well, you shouldn't be worried so much about the numbers, Pat. This is a spiritual thing. So I want to talk a little bit about that because I've even been in that position in the years in the past, and I want to clarify our heart. Okay, a lot of people, a lot of people will say, well, you're just all about the numbers, like that's a bad thing. And and I want to kind of bring a reminder, we're all interested in numbers, and and I want to kind of come, come clean in my heart and kind of transparently with everybody here. We are, we are definitely, I as a pastor, I'm definitely interested in the numbers. Ask me what numbers. Ask me what numbers. The number of people going to heaven instead of going to hell because our church exists, because you're inviting them, because you're talking to them. Ask me what numbers. Ask me what numbers. The number of marriages being restored and saved as opposed to falling in divorce and separation like many of them are falling, right? Some of you are excited. Some of you are like, I must not care. That's okay. Okay? But I, I'm, I'm coming from a place of passion. God, is, I'm interested, and God is interested too, in the number of young people being rescued from bad habits, from drugs, from alcohol, from poor relationship decisions, okay? Those numbers matter. The number of young people being confused in all kinds of identity crises. We have a whole generation being raised. They don't know if they're guys, if they're girls. They don't know how anything works. They're confused. And so I'm, I'm, I'm interested, and God's interested, you better believe it, in the numbers of people being saved and connecting to him and knowing him. Now, I know what some people are concerned about when they express their concerns. It's not about ego. It's not about, oh, you know, look at this. Now look at, look at us. Look how many people came or look at what we did. And look, it's not, about, it's not about our names being glorified. It's about God's name being glorified. Praise God. But listen, if there's one thing we got to be sure and, and in agreement with is that we need to populate heaven and we need to depopulate hell. That's numbers, okay? And so I, I don't know if my passion is coming. I, th- I think I might need to take a breath for a second. I don't want to scare anybody. If you're our first time guest, I'm a lovable guy. But I'm also passionate. What God notices the most is his missing children. His lost children. The reason any of this matters, including numbers, is because heaven and hell are real places that people and souls go to. If heaven and heaven and hell weren't real, what are we doing here? Let's go play basketball. Let's go to the beach. Do you hear me? It's because heaven and hell are real. So numbers matter to God just like they should matter to us. Everybody say numbers matter. I don't, I don't say I have between one and five kids. I have three. Caleb, Sophia, and Nico, right? I'm not okay with I have somewhere between two and five. Or, I know how many kids I have. Why? Because numbers, they matter. You know how much money you have. Why? Because numbers, you know how many kids you have, I hope. Because numbers matter. You always count what matters. Do we agree on that? So yes, we are focused on numbers, and the church should be strengthened in faith and should grow in number daily. This is not anti-biblical. This is biblical. We just read it in Acts 16. And I've heard people say, well, the Lord just, pardon me, pastor, but the Lord just wants me to be faithful. Wrong answer. Let's talk about this for a moment. This is one of those lies that we just convince ourselves. He doesn't want you to just be faithful. God wants you to be fruitful. Or else, how do we explain the parable in Matthew 25? Where where Jesus uh, uh, shares a parable, which is a story with a lesson, about three men, and the Lord, or the, the master of these three men, gave them each different amounts of talents. You guys remember the story? He didn't expect them to be faithful in return. He expected them to be multiplied. You guys remember? In fact, the one who got one talent, what was he? He was faithful with the one, and he brought back one. And remember how the master replied to him? Foolish servant. And it talks, and talks, a little reference there about hell, because it talks about gnashing of teeth, and some of them read it in Matthew 25. So, so let's say it all together. Let's say point number one all together. Ready? It is God's will for my church to grow. Number two, my growth potential is different from yours. 
my growth potential is different from yours. Now, this goes on an individual basis as people, but it also goes on a church basis as, as, as churches. Now, we learn this in the parable of the talents. I don't understand why, I don't know why, but God does not give us all the same amount of responsibilities, the same amount of gifts and talents, or the same amount of resources. But here it's clearly stated that it's not about comparisons. Why? Because my growth potential is different than yours. Vertical church's growth potential is different from some other churches in the community, or in the state, or in the world. We're we're different. We're not here, you're not here to compare yourself to others, you're here to reach your growth potential. Can I get an amen? So, so check this out. In the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, the one who had five talents brought back how many? Ten. Now check this out. In that parable, the one who brought five, the one who had five and brought back ten is equal to the one who had three and brought back six. Because they both returned 100% return on the initial investment, on the initial giving. Are you guys following me? So the one who received three talents wasn't expected to bring back ten. He was expected to be faithful and fruitful. This is a good word for some of us, because some of us here have been, have been glorying ourselves on being faithful and not fruitful. And as a church, this is so important. This is so in the center of God's heart for our church. So God, check this out. God is not going to hold you accountable for what you're not doing. He's going to hold you accountable for what he's called you to do that you got done. So you don't need to be be looking at the other person over there who has a certain amount of talents or abilities or responsibilities or resources and compare yourself to him or her. Because God called him or her to something, and my growth potential is different than his or her. Do you understand me? So God's not going to hold me accountable for what he has not called me to do or what I'm not doing. He's going to hold me accountable to what he has called me to do. And if I'm being faithful and fruitful. So don't worry about comparing yourself to what others do. Worry about what God has called you to do. Let's say number two all together. Can you guys say it with me? My growth potential is different from yours. Number three, last truth about growth that we need to talk about here is I can get better. Can you say that with me? I can get better. One more time. I can get better. Check it out. This is so simple yet so profound. I'm not talking about getting bigger. I'm talking about getting better. I was reminded of a story of the founder of Chick-fil-A, Truett Caffey. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him. Chick-fil-A is a very well-known organ- Christian organization from its founders, Truett Caffey. Now, now check this out. Uh, years ago, they were in a boardroom meeting, and Chick-fil-A was having, all the board of directors were in a meeting, and they were having a lot of uh, issues because they were having certain competition from other restaurants that were kind of invading the space, and they were having all of these, this um, um, back and forth on how they need to get bigger and how they need to get bigger and what do we need to do to get bigger and make and do more. And, and, and the story goes, and the story goes that Truett Caffey, uh, the, the founder, in one moment, he just lifted his hand and slammed his hand on the table and got everybody's attention, which was very out of character for Truett Cathy, for the people who knew him. And in that moment, he made a very important declaration to his whole board of uh, directors because they were all focused on how to get bigger. And he said to them, he said, you guys have missed the point. And this, his statement was, it's not about getting bigger. He said, if we get better, our customers will demand that we get bigger. Have you, ever, have you ever had a good experience at Chick-fil-A? Pretty much every time, right? Can, can I have this? My pleasure. It's very rare that you get a my pleasure from people. But at Chick-fil-A, you're going to get it every time. They started getting better. And guess what happened to the organization? It got bigger. The focus wasn't getting bigger. The focus was getting better. Here at church, we want to get better in every single area all the time. Those who know me and work closely with me and my leaders, they know. My staff here, I'm constantly, constantly on getting better. Constantly. My staff, the staff member, and and any leaders on the impact team, constantly, constantly, we're talking about how can we do better. You know what? We celebrated some great victories on Easter Sunday, but there were some things that we didn't do good and we need to work on. We need to get better because because it's not so much about we want to get bigger so the church is known and it's all about us no we want to get better and guess what happens when we get better the world and the lost around us they're going to demand that we get bigger because the, the, the world is thirsty for something real and we got it man we got the best product we got the best product 
I don't mean to make it into business terminology, but the best thing we can offer this world, this dying world, this lost world, is, is Jesus. We have it. And so, the, and so the question is, man, are we willing to recognize we can get better? Because better demands that we'll get bigger. And guess what? Healthy things grow. Unhealthy things don't grow. Healthy things grow. And so we're on the same page as far as some, some truths about growth. Let's talk about God's vision. Let's talk about God's vision, okay? Doing a little bit of research and going to conferences, learning a little bit about organizational structure and even churches. A lot of times, you know what I found? <laughs> even in our church as we were kind of relaunching our church, a lot of times the vision is not clear. The vision is not clear. It's not being communicated clearly or consistently and sometimes not even compellingly. And so people are not on, the, when the vision isn't clear, people are not on the same page. When the vision isn't clear from the top of an organization to the bottom of the organization, from, from the top leadership, you know, the pastor to the newest member that got on board, if the vision is not clear, we're not on the same page. And so what's so important? What, what am I trying to, to be able to do as a church in this series is come on the same page and understand what the vision and the heart is of our church, which in essence is God's vision. And so many times we don't even know what the win is. So many times in organizations and even churches, sadly to say, we don't know what the win is. You ask one member, you ask them the vision, they'll tell you one thing, and the other one, they'll tell you another thing. And, tell, and this is what constantly happens in churches, in organizations. What is it that we're trying to accomplish together? Is it clearly defined? Is it clearly being communicated? Because we, we can't teach the how we do church if we don't first understand why we're here. Well-known preacher and author D.L. Moody wrote, the following quote, he said, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at something that really doesn't matter. That's pretty deep. So what's the point, Pastor? The point is you can't just aim at anything. You have to aim at the right thing. You have to. And so many people are doing a lot of things but not doing the right thing. So many churches are doing a lot of things but not doing the right things, and the vision isn't clear. And we have a lot of stragglers in church that, that aren't clear. So I said, Lord, forgive me, if, forgive me for not making the vision maybe clearer. And man, I'm praying. I'm praying for all the power and the strength of God that comes when the vision is clear. Proverbs 29, 18 puts it away that many of us have heard it before, even, even outside of the context of church. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. There's another version that says, where there's no vision, the people get lost. People have no, no north. They, have, they don't know where they're going. Ch check out, I don't have it on the screens, but the message version of Proverbs 29 and 18 says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves, but when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. <laughs> Vision. I don't blame anybody for trying, but could it be that some of us are trying so hard at going in a direction that we were never called to go in? Could it be? So, so, I don't want us to think about this as, as your vision or my vision. We need to know God's vision. What does he want us to do? God has a vision, and he's made it clear through his word, and we have to give ourselves to God's vision, and we have to figure out how we can accomplish God's vision. And, and in order, in or, so here's, the, here's, organizationally speaking, you need a vision so you know where you're going. Amen? If, if, I, hand, if I hand a bunch of you a bow and arrow and say, shoot, what's the first question you're going to ask? Yeah, where's, where's the bullseye? What's the goal? Where are we shooting at? And so we have to ask ourselves organizationally, what's the vision? Where are we headed? What's the win? What are we trying to accomplish? And then in order to accomplish the vision, we need something, organizationally speaking, called systems. Can you guys say systems? What is a system? A system is something that you design to deliver the vision. So a system is what you design to deliver the vision. How do you know if it's a good system? If it delivers the vision. What systems should we use? The ones that work. I'm, 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 lately, I've found myself across a desk from pastors um, here in the States and also from Latin America just trying to learn how to help their churches grow because a, a lot of the pastors, a lot of their churches are stuck. They've hit growth barriers. And the, the first questions that I try to aim at with a lot of these pastors and, and, and whenever I meet with their teams is, what's the vision? And you know what the crazy thing is? Sometimes they are all on different pages. 
Not much different than what I assessed in our own organization a couple years back. We didn't have a clear vision. And so if you don't have a clear vision, you don't even know where you're headed. You're not headed in the right direction. And then when you do have a clear vision, if you don't have the right systems, you're not going to accomplish the vision. So, so, so many pastors and churches are trying to use systems that worked 20 years ago. And whenever, when, when you challenge them a little bit on, hey, well, why, why don't you try doing this or adjusting this? Oh, that's never going to change. I'm not going to change that. And I'm like, okay, well, you need to consider this. Why? What systems should we use? The systems that work. Because if it's not working, and your church is not growing, and people aren't getting saved, and people aren't progressing on a spiritual journey, there's something missing. Healthy things grow. So there may be some sunlight missing, maybe some water missing, might be some fertile soil missing. Something might be missing. Are you guys following me? So the systems that we use won't make sense, sense until we first clarify the vision. So I want to talk to you guys in kind of from various portions of the Bible um, and, and just kind of give you a little essence. You can fill out these first blanks with me here or in the middle of the first page. Um, in essence, basically, when we look at the Bible, God's vision is to see lost people saved. You can fill in that, that blank there. In essence, God's vision is to see lost people saved, to see saved people pastored. Some people might use the word discipled, okay? To see pastored people trained, and to see trained people mobilized. So A, nothing can happen. No journey can start unless people are getting saved. Can we, get, can we be clear on that? Now, people get saved, but they still have issues. So they got to be pastored. And then, and then pastor people have to be trained. They got to be taught something. They have to find purpose and train people become mobilized. Why? Because this is a goal. This, this, how, how do we know when we've accomplished it here at Vertical Church, when we've done it, when we've hit, when we've scored a touchdown? When lost, per, when lost people get saved, they go through a process of being pastored and discipled. They, they, they get trained up and then they get mobilized and start serving on a team actively. That's the win for us here at Vertical Church. Now, I, I, I want to make a biblical case that this is God's vision, not just you know, man's vision or our church's organizational structure, okay? So, so I, want, I want to biblically talk about this. Let's go to Exodus chapter 6. Some of you who've been here at church have heard, of, heard me talk about the four cups, right? The four cups, yeah, three of you? Okay, perfect. Some of you guys heard me speak about the four cups, right? Yeah, yeah, Exodus 6. You know, you know, the Jewish people read uh, th this passage in Exodus 6, verses 6 to 7, every year. You guys remember when? You guys remember when? During the Passover feast. You guys remember a couple weeks ago? Some of you, anybody come celebrate the Passover feast with? Man, that was so awesome. So powerful. And, and so, so the context of when this is written back in Exodus chapter 6, okay, is that the people of Israel are still in Egypt. And question, were they shopping in Egypt? Were they like going to malls and stuff? What, what, why, were the Israel, why was Israel in Egypt? They were slaves. They were enslaved. They were chained. They were in slavery in Egypt. So at this point, the people of Israel still were not motivated to run and to go with Moses. And God says to Moses, hey, hey, Moses, they're going to get motivated when you have a plan and you have a vision. So I'm going to present to you a plan and a vision. Here's my vision for my people communicated to them. Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will. There's the first I will statement. I will bring you out. Everybody say bring you out. From under the yoke of the Egyptians. In other words, I'll take you out of there, out of that slavery, that yoke of slavery. Then it says, I will free you from being slaves to them. Then third, third, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. And number and verse seven, I, number four, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So isn't it interesting? And follow me here. Follow me, please. Isn't it interesting that the first statement is, I will bring you out from under the yoke of slavery, and I will get you out of there, which in essence is, is, a, is, a, is an imagery of salvation, like saving from slavery. Isn't it interesting that God says, I will, I will bring you out from, from slavery in, 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 in Egypt, but then the second one is, I will free you from being slaves to them. Isn't that weird? Like, why, why does it say I will free you from being slaves if they're already out of Egypt and not in slavery anymore? Ask me why. Ask me why. Because, because you can be out of Egypt, but Egypt still in you. That hit somebody right now. That hit that. You can be out of Egypt, and Egypt still be in you. I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people that are saved because they've confessed Jesus, they've confessed with their mouth, they've believed in their heart, they've accepted Jesus, they've repented of their sins, and they've received the gift of salvation from, from God. 
but they still have a lot of Egypt left inside. I got an amen? Pastor, you're preaching to me, Pastor. I know. There has to be a pastoral component where you're helping people through their issues. You can be out of Egypt and still be carrying Egypt in you. In other words, you can be saved and still got issues to deal with. Do we understand that? It's part, God understands this. It's part of the process. It's, it's part of the process. We need to be okay with that and understand that. Okay? So there's a salvation component. There's a freedom component. And then there's a redemption component. It says, I will redeem you. To redeem means to put something back to its original intent, function, purpose, design. So it's not enough. Check this out. It's not enough just to get them out of Egypt. It's not enough to get the Egypt out of them. But now you have to help them find what they were supposed to be doing, which was not creating bricks and building bricks in Egypt. Getting them out of the mud pits. D did you know, it's, it's, it's staggering. Studies show that 87% of Christians in churches do not know their redemptive calling. Did you guys hear what number I just said? 87% of Christians in churches do not know their redemptive calling. They do not know their original intent. So they're saved. They've been working on their issues, but they don't know what their redemption is. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And so there's this training component True discipleship is when people discover why they're on this planet. As John Maxwell says, a great leadership guru, right? There's two great days in your life, the day that you're born and the day you discover why you were born. So it's not, it's, it's not about, this training is not just about random Bible study. That's like, that's like going to college and university and doing random learning. No, you go toward the gift setting that you have. You go towards what you're going to school. You study the area of what you are going to specialize in. It's part of what you're going to focus on because you're not going to do every job. You are going to do a specific job. You're not going to do every career and responsibility. You are focusing in on, on the area that you are assigned to. And so real discipleship is focused on your redemptive calling. All right, so, so the first three, I will, statements here. The first three, God develops you individually, but then he puts you in a group of people with a fourth statement. Once you find what you're supposed to do, guess what? You can't do it alone. <laughs> you can't do it alone. You're part of the body. That's why it says, that's why it says there in, in uh, verse 8 of Ephesians, uh, Exodus 6, I'm sorry. It says, I, in verse 7, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. You see how he groups us in that last one? It's, it's plural. It's not just individual. You're a part of the body. Which means, check this out, which means you're a body part. Do you understand that? In the body of Christ, if you're a part of the body, that means that you're a body part. So it doesn't matter if you know you're a hand unless you know where the arm is and you're connected to it. Because a cut off hand in the corner ain't going to do much of a difference to anybody. It needs to be connected. So we can't function unless... God takes us as his own people. And you got to know what part of the body you are and you got to be connected to it. So in the Jewish Passover Seder, like we did a couple weeks ago, there are four cups. Remember? You guys remember? Cup number one, write it in with me. The cup of sanctification. It's known as the cup of sanctification. That's the one where God says, I want to get you out. I want to get you out. Can I say something really quick? It's very important. It's very important that these steps are they're all on their they all stand on their own you guys understand me each step stands on its own if you try to deliver the other ones in the same step you're going to mess it up especially this first one you can't tell people hey you need to get yourself right with god when they haven't even gotten out of egypt you can't get egypt out of their hearts if you haven't gotten them out so let's work you it's foolish to try to drink out of two cups at one time right there's a reason why the cups are in this order. There's a reason why it's one at a time. Sometimes in churches, that's another mistake. Everything, churches and people expect everything to happen on Sunday. Everything has to happen. They got to get saved. They got to get redeemed. They got to get clean. They got to, no, no, no. It's one step at a time. Are you guys following me? Cup of sanctification. And, 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 and you know what? If you tell people, hey, before you get out of Egypt, you got to really get right with God and get yourself really holy. 
you're going to mess up that cup for them. That's not the way God designed it. He lets you come out of Egypt just as you are, completely messed up. He lets us come out of Egypt. It's, it's, not about, it's, it's just about believing in him and putting our eyes on him and recognizing it's all about Jesus. Then it can lead you to cup number two, which is the cup of deliverance. It's officially known as the cup of the plagues because remember God sent 10 plagues to Egypt. Remember that? In order to, to, for Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go. But in essence, it, it, the 10 plagues represents deliverance. There's a deliverance component that we have to deliver to people as, as a church. So people got to get saved and then saved people got to get delivered from that Egypt that's still in them. Number three is the third is the cup of redemption. The cup of redemption. We got to get them back to their original intent, redemption. And then lastly is the cup of praise, which the Jewish people call Hallel. Everybody say Hallel. That's where we get the word Hallelujah from. Now to us, Hallelujah is a, is a word that we sing a lot in, in songs. But to the people of Israel, Hallel refers to the condition of your soul. Hallel, it's the condition of your soul. And one of the best words that we can probably come up with in the English language to compare is the word fulfilled or fulfillment. That's Hallel. So people got saved, people got delivered, people got redeemed, and then they got together. And that brings God praise and it brings his people fulfillment. You guys see it? If we advance a couple hundred years forward, we get to the prophet Isaiah. I'm not going to have time to go into detail. But in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 to 4, many of you have heard these verses. And the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim what? Good news to the poor. And he sent me to bind up the broken hearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord and the favor of the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them check this out a crown of beauty instead of ashes that's purpose that's 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 redemption the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair they will be called oaks of righteousness a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore rebuild together you can't rebuild alone rebuild they they will rebuild together together right the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated and they will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations you see that you can write them in with me basically what this is saying in this passage is proclaim good news you can write in there proclaim good news bind up broken hearts bestow on them beauty instead of ashes they rebuild others. You see how we see it? You see? We, we see, you know, the, the whole aspect of salvation, of deliverance, freedom, you know, healing, the whole issue of purpose and hope, and then the issue of together, right? Rebuilding. If we advance a couple hundred years further and now go into the New Testament, we can see a little bit about the disciples in the early church, including Paul. Let's look at Mark chapter 16. Again, I'm not going to go into detail, and, and you, you can see the verses up on the screen. Mark 16, 15, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up uh, snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then, check this out, the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accomplished. I'm sorry, that accompanied it. So what were they devoted to? Preach, preaching, pastoring, discipling, and sending. So we see the common theme throughout all the word. Now look at Paul, Colossians 1.28. Colossians 1.28, Paul and the early church. Check out Paul. Paul says, he is the one we proclaim. What did they do? Proclaim. They proclaim Christ. Preach, right? Admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. There's that teaching component, that pastoring, that discipling, so that we may present everyone fully mature to Christ. The growth, the purpose, maturity. To this end, I strenuously contend with all energy. Christ so powerfully works in me. Proclaim Christ to them, admonish them, teach them, and help them reach their full potential. Are you guys seeing it? God has never changed his mind on what he wants. His vision has been clear from the beginning. We see it in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. What does God want to do? He wants to take people on a spiritual journey through steps that he has for each one of us. 
Look, look, at, look at one more thing that Paul says, and, he, and we'll land on this main passage, Ephesians 1.16. And Paul trains up the Ephesian church, and he shows them that there's a four-step process, same four steps. And it says in 1.16, it says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why do you need wisdom and revelation? So you can understand and see, right? So that you may know him better. You may what? I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his what? In his holy people. Okay, so stop for a minute. What does Paul say here? He says, praying for wisdom and revelation so that you may what? So that you may know him better. The original word there in the original is the word gnosko. Gnosko, some of us in Spanish know conozco. And gnosko means an intimate no. Not no here, no here. You understand? So, so you can't have the next steps unless you begin with knowing him, right? And then it says, and it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The eyes of your what? Heart, not the eyes of your head. The eyes of your heart. Why does Paul say that? Because every one of us in our life, we are looking through the filter of the eyes of our heart. What does that mean, Pastor? Let me, let me explain that. All of us are looking through the filter of everything that's happened to us to this point in our lives. A lot of us are looking through the filter of our wounds, of our hurts, and maybe our physical eyes are fine, but our heart eyes are messed up, and, and there's a lot of crud from all the wounds and the hurt. And so we're looking through a filter that's not clean and not clear. That's why Paul addresses the eyes of the heart. So, so in essence, Paul is saying, you got to start seeing better. But you can't do this without first knowing God. You can't do it without God. Listen, you can go to all the therapy and therapists that you want to, but only God can heal, truly heal a heart. So if you know God and you can get your eyes, the, heart, the eyes of your heart clear, now you can know the hope to which he's called you. Purpose. Redemption. You can know that. I love how, how Paul connects it with hope. Hope is connected to your calling. Greatest hope isn't for a better day. It's to know what your role is in that better day. To know why I'm here. To know my calling. So the best way I have found to pastor people isn't to help them through their issues, although sometimes we help them through their issues. The best way to help them with their issues is to give them something bigger than their issues in life. Because some of us are so overwhelmed and drained down by our own issues. We can't even take, we can't go past this step. So if you help people find their calling, they'll find hope. And then it takes you to the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, a group. You see that? The same four steps. It can only happen if people go on a spiritual journey. You can write these four points in, and you hear it all the time here at church. The four things that God wants for every person, including yourself and myself, is to know God, number one. To know God. Everybody say, know God. Number two, find freedom. Find, everybody say, find freedom. Number three, discover purpose. Can you guys say that with me? Discover purpose. And number four, make a difference. Can you say that with me? Make a difference. Now we take these verses filled with God's vision from Old Testament to New Testament and we put some terminology and systems in place in order to deliver God's vision. That brings us to where we are at Vertical Church, a place to grow. And I want to close off this message by just sharing what we do, but then also why we do what we do. Because I'm convinced that some of you that even have been here for a while, you're here and we love you and you love us, but you don't really get it. And I want you to be on the same page and run with the same vision and be committed and connected to it if you feel God calling you here. Amen? So whose vision is it? Is this Pastor Verge's vision? No. Is this man's vision? No, this is God's vision. But guess what? God's vision has become our vision as a church. God's vision is our vision. What's the first thing? The first thing that God wants, wants, wants us to do. What's the first thing? What's the first thing he wants? We, want, we should know God. Now, we talked about the vision, right? And we talked about what do we need in order to accomplish the vision? We need the right systems. So here at Vertical Church, if we're clear that part of God's vision, the first step, the first thing is that people would know God. What's the system that we use here at Vertical Church for people to know God? 
Sunday services. Can you write that down with me? Sunday services. Man, I'm really, I'm really trying to lay this out in a way that we can all get, that we can all run with. And I really, really pray in my heart that we get this. What do we want people, what do we want people to, what's the first thing we want people to do? To know God. Cup one, get them out. We, God wants to get, bring them out of that slavery in Egypt. But there's a difference between knowing God here and knowing God for real. Matthew 7, this is a verse that's kind of scary when you read it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a problem because some people said, oh, all I had to do was say the name of Lord and I'm saved. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did, in, did we in, in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never, what, what? Gnosko. I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. That's a problem because some thought, well, I'll, I'll, they told me all, all I had to do was say the name of the Lord and I'd be saved. But then this is saying something here. And then, you know, it's saying that a lot of Christian type things to do, perform miracles, driving out demons and prophesying your name. And these people, I didn't even know them. And that's the first point. We just want people to get to the point where they can know God. So what's the system we use for people to know God? See, see, Sunday, this, you guys aren't going to pass this test next week, I don't think. What's the system we use to people to know God? Sunday services. So what do we do? We create weekend services that lost people love to attend and believers get a lot out of. I'm going to get down into, into kind of the, 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 down in the dirt of why we do, how we do Sundays. We do Sunday services that lost people love to attend and believers can get a lot out of. Why? 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 Because the first thing God wants to do is what? He wants people to know him. So our Sunday services are not designed to challenge your 20-year spiritual maturity. Part of you that wants to just load deeper, deeper revelations that are going to break my mind. That's not what Sundays at Vertical Church is all about. Are you, are you following me? You know, this kind of reminded me. I, I told this story last year at some point. Um, last year, I t- my family and I, we went to Animal Kingdom. And there's a new section in Animal Kingdom. There's a new section called Pandora. I don't know if anybody's seen it or been there. Based on the movie Avatar. And that when we went, it was like the first week or the second week of it had opening. You guys want to know how, how, the, how the amount of people there was like packed. Hundreds of thousands of people just, I mean, just in one area of the park. And of course we had to go. And I'm, I'm, with, I'm with my wife, just land. I'm with Caleb, my 10-year-old. At that point in time, nine. Sophia was seven. Nico was four at that time. And we are in Pandora. And we're checking it out. But the, you, literally it's like walking sideways. And we have a stroller. So they're trying to get to the people. The, the, the attractions, the lines were like two-hour waits. And, and okay, so we, we did something. We did one of the rides. We came out. Going back to find our stroller, because we got little ones. We had to find our stroller, find our bag and everything. And as we're going out, going through the people, walking through the people, we get there. I'm putting Nick, Nico back in his stroller. And that moment, I hear my, my daughter, Sophia, say, where's Caleb? I was sure that he was probably on the other side, or maybe Gislaine was, was talking to him. And that, then I heard, a, you know, a mother's voice when she can't see her, her child. Then I heard, Where's Caleb? And my eyes open big, and I turned around, and I don't see Caleb, my nine-year-old. And there are thousands of people all around and up, and it's getting, like, you know that twilight darkness, that, that darkness, like, right when the, that kind of darkness. You want to know what happens to my heart inside my chest in that moment? Where is my lost son is all I could think about in that moment. There is not one other thing that I could be distracted by in that moment that could matter or compare to the issue that I needed to find. Who? My lost son. What, what probably took about maybe three to four minutes, maybe, felt like an eternity. Mothers and fathers probably know this. They've experienced something like this. I'm walking. I went back towards the ride, the exit that we got out of, trying to see if I could find something. And walking through people, I was bumping into people because there was no room. And I was desperate, and I was screaming, Caleb! I probably look crazy. Then I walked it. Uh, he wasn't at the exit. I went in another direction, and somebody said, there's a boy crying over there. There's a boy crying. Where, where, that way? And I started running. And I found him standing next to one of the attendants to one of the other rides, one of the other attractions, crying. I saw my son from a distance crying. My heart was broken, but at the same time so relieved. And despite the fact that I wanted to spank him for staying away from us, I embraced him and hugged him because I found my lost son. 
Do, do you want to know if I, if I would have gone to like a, an attendant or to like a security guard and I would have been like, my son is missing. And he would have been like, so where's the last place you've seen him? Like, mm. I would have been so disappointed with his inactivity. Or can you imagine if in the middle of that, Sophia would have tugged my pants and said, Daddy, can we get ice cream? I would have said, Sophia, get out of my face and help me find your lost brother. Right? And sometimes I feel like the church, there's a lot of Christians and even pastors, we're so focused on the people that are already here and already know God, we completely have forgotten about all of God's lost children. And while, he, while we're here complaining, I want something to satisfy me on Sunday morning. God is saying, can you step aside and help me find my lost children? Can you see God's father heart in this? And while we're having our discussions about what kind of music and what kind of lighting and who is this and what's coming out, and I don't think that's the theology. that, And God is saying, like, go have your, you know, go... You know, you want ice cream? Like, get out of my way. I'm distracted by all the lost people. Anybody have a lost family member? Anybody have a lost friend? Lost neighbor? Lost colleague? Lost classmate? Yeah. Anybody maybe lost still a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of us are still lost. And so, there's something about God's heart. That's why we do Sundays how we do it. My goal here on Sunday is not to challenge the highest doctrine of theology that the highest person of spiritual maturity here is. I have a question. Are there any uh, 13 or 14-year-olds in the house right now? Any 13, 14, 15-year-olds? Yeah? Can you raise your hand? Raise your hand. Yeah? Yeah. We got some young ones. They're, they're, this is their first year in the auditorium. Can we give it up for them? Can we get up for the young people here? We also have some new believers that are just trying out God and trying out church recently. And so if I preach with this super hyper-Christian terminology and this religiosity and all these words that are going to just dazzle the Christian believers of 30 years... I'm going to be speaking right over the people who need Jesus the most. And so that's why so many churches are dying and pastors are missing it. They're missing it because they've forgotten about lost children. They've, they're not distracted by the lost. They're distracted by the found. And the found are consuming the time and the attention of the pastors and the leaders. And, and, and instead of making an impact, some churches are diminishing. So I'm seeing church buildings for sale. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we doing the right things? Are we using the right systems? I'm never going to change that, Pastor. Well, the system doesn't seem to be working because it's not bringing about a vision. Is there a vision? Is it God's vision? So, so if, if, if you don't like finding lost people, vertical church might not be the best fit for you. And I'm okay saying that, and I don't, I don't mean it in an offensive way, but if, if what you are needing and requiring personally is a lot of attention and what you want, then this is not going to be the best place for you because we are consumed and distracted by lost people here. And that's how we're going to do our Sundays because we're here to please God and God is distracted by his lost children. Does that make sense to anybody? That, that, so I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. So if your biggest complaint is I don't like all the traffic getting in and out of services, if that's your, I mean, that's a good problem to have. But if you don't like that problem, there's plenty of churches you can go to. There's no traffic issues. In fact, you can sit, you can park in the first spot. There ain't a lot of people fighting for traffic there. You can sit wherever you want. Are you getting me? Are you getting my heart? And I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't um, criticize. I, I understand what God's calling us to do. I, I, I don't, got other pastors, other churches, they got to do what God is calling them to do. I, I find that when we become critical, <laughs> When we, when, we, when we are ineffective and we are not growing, we become highly critical of those who are. A little side note for somebody there. John, John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commands. Now check this out. A pastor really broke this down for me in a way that makes sense. When you know God, oh, check it. No, when you don't know God, you know how you read this verse? When you don't know God, you want to know how you read this verse? If you love me, you'll keep my commands. A person who doesn't know God as a father, as a personal God, reads, if you love me, keep my commands. That's what a person does. When you know God, you read, if you love me, you keep my commands. So it depends on what side of the comma you want to be on. You know God or you don't know God. So we want people to know God. That takes us to point number two as we close up. 
We want people to find freedom. What's our system here at Vertical Church to help people find freedom? Life groups. Because we got to deal with the issues of the heart, but you can't deal with the issues of the heart here on Sunday because there's a lot of people here. Most of us here, how you doing? I'm good. Most of us here on Sundays, how you doing, bro? Blessed, man. Even if we're not, we just, that's what we say, right? But when you're in a small group, in a life group, Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. When you're in a life group, you begin to take off your mask, open your heart, and be real. That's why so many of you, please, pardon me stepping on your toes for a moment. So many of you are so resistant to, to being part of a life group because you think, I'm not, I'm not going to drink that Kool-Aid. I'm not going to do that weird stuff. I'm, I'm just a normal person. I'm not weird. It's not weird, man. It's, that's the place where you're going to begin healing and finding f- true freedom. Because most of us aren't willing to talk about the real issues of our heart, even with our spouse sometimes. So get with, some, get with some other men where you can start. I was in a life group yesterday with some, with some men, some brothers in Christ, in a life group uh, uh, with Brother Raul, uh, about maybe eight or nine guys, and they're going through a study on the armor of God. And all these guys are guys who've been through freedom, who's, which is one of our life groups. It's like a step, step two for some of these men. And, uh, man, they're just studying the armor of God and just hearing them and, and being there. And I'm a life group coach for them and just seeing, man, I, my, my, the hairs on my arm just stand up, just seeing them grow. Man, they're taking these next steps. They have vision. God is doing some great things. Talking about how they're putting on the armor of God and how they're, man, I was so encouraged. Where does that happen? Where does that, that doesn't happen on Sundays. It's too many people. This is is people to know God and for us to worship God together, right? But in life group, man, you just start to connect. Some of you are not connected to life group and that's why part of your life is not thriving and it never will. Never will. Some of you are trying to jump from cup one to cup three. Never works out of order. Believers of many, many years Try to skip step two. Not connected in the right relationships. Everybody wants freedom. People want freedom. God created a system for freedom, and it is in the relationships around us. James 5.16a says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Who do we confess to? <laughs> Check this out. We can, each other can't forgive. We confess to God for forgiveness, but we confess to one another for healing. That explains why some people have received forgiveness from God in certain areas, but not healing. There's so much here. We're going to be going into each one of these in the next couple of weeks. So I'm, 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 we're going to get down and dirty in each one of them. So, so, what, so, so what is the focus? It's, it's life groups. The system that we use is life groups, small groups. They are relational and they are life-giving. The key is... All of our ministry happens in groups. We do things differently. Before, we used to be a church that had all kinds of events and all kinds of ministries. No longer. Those systems aren't working. They're not providing, they're not uh, uh, de- de- delivering the vision. Before, it was all kinds of ministries and men's ministry. No, no, now we have men's groups. We have women's groups. We have restoration, personal, inner healing life groups. We have financial. We have life groups for all the areas and categories. We do ministry in groups. And, and we no longer do events. We focus on groups. Oh, I used to like the events. Yeah, a lot of people like the events, but the events weren't, weren't delivering the vision. Events don't change a person's life, but the right relationships will. Three, discover purpose. So what's the system we use at Vertical Church to help people discover purpose? The growth track, the vertical growth track. We try to make it as easy as possible. It's every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. When is it? Every Sunday, 2.30 p.m. What's the Sunday again, Pastor? Every Sunday. First, second, third, and fourth Sunday of every month. Every once in a while, there's a fifth Sunday and might not have anything on the fifth Sunday. Or this month, we actually have second, third, fourth, and fifth because of Easter. But when's the growth track? When is it? What day is it again? What day? What day? Oh, Sunday. That's right. Which, which Sunday of the month is it? Every Sunday. Class one, two, three, four. That's how easy and how simple we want to make it for people to know you can always connect to the church. Ephesians 4, 7 to 13. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who, as, who descended is the very one who ascended higher than, than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Verse 11, key verse. So Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's the leadership, spiritually speaking, in church. To do what? To do all the ministry themselves? No, to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the hope and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So the leadership's responsibility is not to do the ministry. The leadership responsibility in church is to equip the church to do the ministry. 
that's God's design. That's where some of us went wrong many years ago because we were doing everything as leaders and not allowing people who were gifted in areas to use their gifts. Romans 12, 6, part A says we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So we want to help you discover those gifts through the growth track. That's why the third class we do a spiritual, a spiritual gifts assessment personality assessment and a passions assessment. Why? So you can discover your design. Why? Because your design reveals your destiny. It's on purpose. God put that in you. So we don't think events. We think steps. Our spiritual journey is full of steps. Next steps. Lastly, number four. So how do we make a difference? What's the system that we use at Vertical Church to make a difference? The impact team. What's the impact team? It's everybody who serves in church in any team. Sundays and throughout the week. Because there's a part of the promise that's together. It's not just by ourselves. We can't do it alone. We can't make a difference alone. But together, woo, there's a lot we can do. First Peter 4.10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Who should use the gifts they've received? Who, who, who? Each of you, you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. It's gift-oriented ministry. I promise you we will never ask you to do something that you are not gifted to do here at Vertical Church. In fact, we will highly recommend you not to. <laughs> and sometimes we think we're gifted in certain areas and we might not be. And we need to be okay with hearing some truth. Okay? So we're never going to ask you to serve in an area you're not gifted in. We're gonna, and, and you know what? We don't recruit here to serve. We discover discover what has God already put in you. You don't need to, you need to come up. God put it in you already. Are you using it? Have you developed it? How can you use it more? How can you be better? And lastly, the last blank you have there. So what's success? How do we know that we're being successful in the vision that we have as a church? How? Success is when people are moving on the spiritual journey that God has for them. Keyword, moving. Have you ever felt stuck? Have you ever felt like you're not going anywhere? Have you ever felt like you're just pressing the pedal but getting nowhere? That's what it feels like when you're not progressing, when you're not moving. And that's why success is when people are moving on the spiritual journey that God has for them. So what's our goal here at Vertical Church? <laughs> the vision is clear. I, we, we state it, and the way that I say it kind of in sentence form is Vertical Church exists to point people up to God, teach them to follow Jesus, and equip them to make a difference. The four things is God wants and Vertical Church wants people to know God, find freedom, Discover purpose. Make a difference. Here's, I promise this is the last question on the quiz for today. Because I want to see if it's falling, if it's high. What's the system we use for people to know God? Sunday services. What's the system we use for people to find freedom? Life groups. What's the system we use for people to discover purpose? And what's the system we use here for people to make a difference? Serving on the team. Yeah. Great answer. You guys must have a good teacher. Amen, amen. So, here, so here's, I'm going to wrap it up really simple. Man, I'm gonna, we're going to get into each one of these over these next couple of weeks. God put it in my heart. We need to know the vision. We need to be on the same page. I, I have come to the understanding, and, and the Lord told me, and I'm okay with it. There might be people along the way that, that don't get it or, or that don't feel called to this vision, and we're okay with that because maybe he really needs you. He needs that person somewhere else. But if you can identify with this vision, which is not my vision or our vision, it's God's vision. If you can identify with it and say, man, this makes sense. I see it and I want to run with it. Because some of you have seen it, but you're not running with it. Some of you have walking with it, but you're not running with it. So, so if you can see it and you can run with it and, you're, and you say, man, this could be, I, I encourage you. Number one, if you don't know God, I'm going to invite you to say a prayer right now to know God. Number two, if you know God, allow God to begin to work in you and, and bring that freedom through the right relationships through life groups. If you're not in a group, find one. And then lastly, if you're doing that, if you, if you have been through that and a you know, cup of sanctification, a cup, cup of deliverance, and, 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 you, and you're not, you don't know what your gift is, you don't know what your purpose is, your, what your design is, do the growth track and jump on the team and start serving and walk through the journey that God has for you. Not to please the pastor. To please, it doesn't really affect me directly or indirectly, but it's for you. It affects me that I serve God where God's calling me to serve. And so let's just wrap it up and just, just start in, in point number one. If None of it is possible if you don't drink from the first cup. <laughs> none of the other stuff is possible if you don't first know God. So if you're here and you don't know God, or you're here and you're far from God, or you're here and you came to know God at one point, but your life is very, very far from God now, 
This is the day to draw near to God, to open your heart. Close your eyes with me. Bow your head. If you're here today and you can be honest before God and with yourself and say, man, I really don't know God. Not in my heart. Or I'm really far from God right now. Or I don't know what I believe, but I'm willing to try. That's where you find yourself today. I want to invite you to say this prayer. We call it a prayer of faith. It's not hyper-spiritual, religious, or mega weird. It's just making a decision to believe that Jesus is who he said he is, accept his sacrifice on the cross, and repent of your sins and say, I want a new life. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you say, Pastor Virgin, include me in this prayer, I want to make this decision today to accept Jesus or to recommit my life to Jesus. If that's you today, can you just raise your hand? I want to see who I'm praying with today. And man, I see your hands. Thank you. I see your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put them down. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Good seven or eight hands. Thank you, Lord. All right, so church, all together, I want us to repeat this prayer for the benefit of those who do it for the first time or maybe even recommit today. Let's all stay together. Thank you, Lord, for loving me and forgiving me. Today I recognize I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to pay the price on the cross. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that Jesus died and he rose again to give me life, to forgive my sins, and save me. I accept you, Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins. And Holy Spirit, I invite you in my life. I want to go on a spiritual journey. I want to know you. I want to find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Church. First of all, those of you who said that prayer for the first time, I'm so proud of you, and I'm so encouraged by you. If you could just, if you could just let us know, we don't ask anybody to get up or come forward. All we, all we ask is just let us know. My decision today on the bottom right of that connection card that you have in front of you, and this is the best way that we can continue celebrating the spiritual victories in this house. Amen. And you know what? Can I, can I tell you something that I, that I love? Every Sunday, there's connection cards coming to my office. Every single Sunday evening, I rejoice with stacks of people recommitting, of people getting saved, of new first-time guests connecting to our church and so let's believe that God has called us to a high vision and he's given us and empowered us with his word which has shown us the right systems and together we're going to reach a lot of lost people amen so as the worship uh, team gets ready to sing this song I'm going to ask any of our team leaders for prayer ministry in the front if you need prayer for any little thing big thing medium thing we have some leaders here that are ready and willing to pray with you and for you and we're going to give to God so we have some baskets up in the front you can prepare tithe and offering we're going to give God what's already his tithes and offerings if you're visiting us if you're our first time guest (laughs) don't worry about this part we don't expect that from you but if this is your church home where you get fed on a weekly basis give God what is God's honor him out of the out of the treasure of, of uh, where our treasure is, there our heart is. So, um, if you're online, verticalchurch.com.